Morning, glory, evening, grace, brother, and sister, grace, everybody back along with us here with a word awakening and our revival preaching. I look forward to today's uh, biographical sketch of George Whitfield. And so I'll certainly uh, look forward to looking at uh, this great uh, man of God. All uh, right, quick, we will uh, go ahead, take, and uh, pray for revival. And I'll pray for all the needs that are out there. And then we'll uh, get a few announcements, and I have the preaching. Now, Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for the gifts of sin. We're so thankful, Lord God, for our salvation and for this ministry and all of your many blessings, Lord, and what you've called us to do, Father. And I pray that we would just meditate upon that and penetrate, Lord God, on your goodness and of the revival that you want us to have and what you can do with our hearts and souls that are completely surrendered to you. And I just pray that we would have your power and that you would just work in our hearts and lives and that you would revive us and that you'd call more people in to revive us. And just help us, Lord, in that way that only you can. Help us have complete faith in you, Lord. <clears throat> just have that a believing faith that you can and that you will. And we pray for all the needs that are out there, Lord. I know there are many out there. We pray for all the physical needs, all those on the bed of affliction, that you just touch and help those people, for those that are uh, discouraged, that you'd encourage them, those back so that you'd reclaim them, and those lost, that you'd convict them and save them. You know, each and every event of your heart. You know, also the financial needs, the emotional needs, all the spiritual needs. And I pray that we would all just be revived and that we would all just grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we'd be what you'd have us to be and do, Lord, what you'd have us do, that we go down that path that you have for us in life and that we'd be used uh, mightily of thee and that you just give us an unction from on high, Lord God, Lord, and just hide us find the cross. And we're so thankful, Lord God, for our prayer warriors and those that live for you, those that walk with you. And I pray that we would just be that prayer warrior, Lord, praying for revival having revival in our hearts and lives and that more people would get a hold of it and help us all just to be for thee and thee alone, Lord God. Just bless uh, this ministry, bless uh, Word Bible Institute as well, Temperance Awakening, and also pray, Lord God, that you would bless uh, all the other ministries that are out there, Lord God, associated with this one. And thank you so much for our dear listeners. I pray you'd bless and help them and encourage them and use them for your own and glory, Lord God. And just be with us as we preach here today to this great man of God, justice. And we'll be careful, Lord, to give you all and all the praise and all the glory for all the courage of you long for it's in the blessed name of Jesus Christ. We pray all these things. Amen. Amen. And uh, so by way of announcements, of course, we've uh, been doing our uh, vaping lectures, uh, trying to upload that every single day, a 28-day step that we have. And so we're doing nine each and every day, so keep that in mind. And uh, with the Word Bible Institute, we'll be back in our sign language class uh, this week. And so uh, we look forward to continuing in that. <clears throat> and uh, actually also here in a couple of weeks, uh, we're going to be starting like a, a graduate, a graduate program associated with the Word Bible Institute. Uh, we have a master's degree lined out. <clears throat> and currently what we have right now with a master's degree is a master's degree in religion. And then also what we're working on is a Ph.D. in world religions, which is like what I have. <clears throat> and so in conjunction, uh, like with our uh, Word Bible Institute, we're going to be having Word Religion School. We're going to call that a religion school for the time being because the Masters and the Doctorate that we'll have in, is in like a religion, World Religions. And so it's probably going to have like uh, it's on, uh, like it's on website and like it's on YouTube channel, uh, like where that's going to be uploaded. And so uh, we'll tell people more about that whenever that time comes, like in a week or two whenever we start the first class. <clears throat> And so now if you have a Bible, and I encourage you to, to follow along, we'll start off reading a verse here in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 23, a very familiar verse. And in Colossians chapter 3, I'm looking at verse number 23, <clears throat> the Bible says, Whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not unto men. And our Lord, we uh, do thank you so much for this ministry and for our salvation. So I uh, such a thankful heart for all your many blessings. And just pray, Lord, that you bless your word and that you would take and multiply the preaching that we have here, Lord God, that you just touch hearts and souls with our revival preaching. And may you just uh, have a liberty to move and touch hearts and souls as only you can. Thank you so much for this challenge. And just help us all to do likewise, Lord God. Just completely sell out to you be, to be for thee and thee alone, Lord God. For it's in the blessed name of Jesus Christ we pray all these things. Amen. And amen. And the revivalist George Whitfield was born December 22nd, 1714. And he lived until September 31st, 1770. He was born in Gloucester, England. The last child to Thomas and Elizabeth Nee Edwards Whitfield 
who were hotel owners. Brother Whitfield's father died when he was only two years old, which led Whitfield to help his mom with their hotel when he was a little older. The Reverend went to grammar school at the Crypt School in Gloucester. After battling a bad illness and reading The Life of God and the Soul of Man uh, by the Scottish theologian Henry Scougal, Whitfield repented of his sin and was gloriously saved. Whitfield studied theology at the University of Oxford. As, uh, as business at the inn had diminished, that you know him and that his, his uh, mother owned that he was helping her with, the minister didn't have money to pay tuition. He had to enroll as a servitor, the lowest rank of undergraduate at Oxford. A servitor was granted free tuition as they acted as a servant to fellows and fellow commoners, cleaning their rooms, carrying their books, and assisting them with their work. Being so passionate about the ministry, Whitfield joined the Holy Club at Oxford that was started by Charles Wesley, and he continued friendships with John and Charles Wesley throughout his life. And so looking there at the passion of George Whitfield, which uh, uh, we'll look at uh, you know, very brief here compared to his full biography, but like we read there, Colossians 3.23, And whatsoever ye do... Do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not unto men. So whatever we do in our life, which everybody does something, there's no really, there is no neutral about action, and there certainly is no, is no being neutral about our spiritual life. In a spiritual life, somebody's either going to be going forward or they're going to be going backward. You know, there's no neutral with God. If, if you try to sit idle with God, then you're going to be going backwards. But see, whatsoever we do first, we do it heartily. We do it from the heart. Like we've often mentioned here with this ministry, like that's particularly what we looked at. Uh, like with John Wesley, who was big on, you know, Christian perfection, who was good friends with George Whitfield. See, once again, that certainly doesn't mean that a person is sinlessly perfect. But that means that a person is mature with God and that they have the right heart about the matter. They do what they do as a servant for God, like it says here. You do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Not doing things for attention. But with the right motive, just because you love the Lord and you want to see people come to the saving knowledge of Christ and you also want other people to grow in the Lord. And, you know, that's certainly why we do this ministry, why we have it. We want people to grow in the Lord and embrace what God has for them. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 24 says, And they that are Christ is have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. And that's the challenge that an individual has if you want revival. Well, certainly if you want revival, you've got to give your time to that. You've got to carve out the time to pray, to be in the Bible. Like I've mentioned many times before, like I particularly heard about all my life, you know, like I was born in 1986, and that was, it was a little before then, I believe, when the world really started to diminish, especially the United States. But then, you know, ever since that time, like ever since the 70s and the 80s, you know, there's just been a downward spiral in morality. And I've heard lots of people say, need revival, need revival. Yes, we do. Why haven't we had a revival, you know, as a whole, as a people of God? Because people don't really desire it. <clears throat> they don't really desire it as they should. Because they won't crucify the flesh. That's why we did that uh, on here. We did another of one of those recent uh, uh, short videos called Foot Bell. I did that on purpose. You know, Bell, the idol in the Bible, like football, Foot Bell, you know, about sports idolatry. Because there are people who say revival, revival, yet, you know, they spend all their time and all that other stuff in ball games and, and television and movies and so forth. And they won't crucify the flesh. They won't spend time in the Word of God. They won't spend time praying for a Bible. You know, like these men that we're looking at, you know, who spent hours in prayer, hours in the Word of God, who were a faithful witness, who were just completely sold out to God, and that's why they had revival. You know, we're not going to have a revival whenever you spend five minutes with God a day. You know,
know, and you spend five hours on entertainment. You know, we've got to get rid of the lust and get rid of that affection for the world and put it on the Lord Jesus Christ and put it on the things of God. Like uh, Matthew 6.21. Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, where's your treasure really at? You know, what do people look forward to each and every day? You know, that ball game, you know, that comes on? Like, when it comes to things, you know, of a religious nature, people often say they have a short attention span. Like, I didn't mention this in this biographical sketch, I mentioned just about everything except that in a concise manner about George Whitfield. But, you know, whenever he would preach, preach in the open fields, you know, he would sometimes preach about three hours at a time. <laughs> you know, that was common for those people back then, those preachers. You know, they preached for like three hours in church and, you know, out in the, out in the open fields. But, you know, when it comes to things, you know, like that, like church, people have a short attention span. You know, we could only listen to, you know, have like 15 minutes of hymn singing, 15 minutes of special singing, 30 minutes of preaching. You know, let's go to the house. You know, I can't, I can't sit, you know, more than, more than 30 minutes at a time and pray and study the Bible. But, you know, there are people that get up at like 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturdays and, you know, they sit in front of a television all day long and watch college football and never get bored with that. You know, they can go down to the mall or Walmart and shopping plazas and go shopping all day long and never get bored with that. See, they never get bored with the things of the world, but, but you know, the things of God, you got a short attention span about. Why? Because that's where the treasure is. That just shows where their treasure is. Where your treasure is, that will your heart be also. See, and there are people that get... So excited about the worldly things, but no excitement about the things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That's the kind of heart that we have. Let's do it all to the glory of God. See, and the more you love the glory of God, the more you're going to hate the world. The more you're going to be disgusted with the world. The more you're going to be disgusted with these little G-Gods, with these idols that are out in the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting verse number 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. We got a race to run here. And we're in a fight. And we should be in that for the Lord. For the Lord's honor. And for the Lord's will. Now we'll go over to Psalms and look at the 73rd chapter. Psalm 73, and looking at verses 25 and 26. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire but thee, beside thee. See, is that what we really desire is God? Do we really desire His honor and, and His glory? My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Is that really where our heart's at? Is that our heart's strength? Psalm 84, 2. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. 
See, there's a desire. See, what do you desire in life? Another really good spiritual test. What does your heart really desire? Now, for that sports team to win another championship? You know, to be in front of that television, to watch that show, to watch that movie? <clears throat> you know, to get all the financial gain, to get all the material things? Or does our heart desire to do the will of God? Do we desire to grow in the Lord? Do we desire to be a witness? Because, see, if you desire the right thing, you'll grow the way you're supposed to. Of course, growing is a never-ending thing. I'm a man that has a lot of education that's been preaching for more than 20 years total. But I know that I still certainly don't know everything. What I have to have is, is a desire for this. a desire for the things of God. See, and if you desire it right, then you'll grow right. You'll grow in prayer. You'll grow in the Word. You'll grow as a witness. That's the thing that I stress to young preacher boys. You know, what you need to have is a desire. You know, you're a young preacher boy. You know, you certainly don't know everything about the Bible. And you may not even know for sure, you know, what God wants you to do in a full-time ministry. You know, you might know, might not know yet if God wants you to be a pastor, like a missionary or an evangelist. But you have to have that desire, have that desire to preach. You know, like you let your pastor know, you know, if you need somebody to fill in, you know, I want to preach. You let me preach. You know, you have a desire, you know, as a young preacher, you know, to have a lay ministry, to preach on the street and nursing homes and so forth, wherever you can. You, know, you have that desire. You spend time in the Word of God. You spend time in prayer. Psalm 27.4 Psalm 27, 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. See, don't we want to see the beauty of God? You know, don't we want to see His glory? Hey, Amen, like we looked at in that football sports idolatry, used that verse in Isaiah, like where I, the Lord said, you know, I will not give my glory to another you know, in the world, they have all these little G God, all these idols out there with their fake glory. But we should desire to see real beauty, the real glory of the Lord. His so brother Whitfield preached his first sermon at St. Mary de Crip Church in 1736. For a couple of years, Whitfield was the leader of the Holy Club when the Wesley brothers were in the American colonies. In 1738, Whitfield traveled to the American colonies himself to become pastor of Christ Church in Savannah, Georgia. While there, he determined that one of the biggest needs for the area was an orphanage. The Bethesda Orphanage was established. That's now known as Bethesda Academy, and it is the oldest extent charity in North America. Now, with such a great burden for people to hear the gospel and be saved, Whitfield began preaching in the fields to the poor and working class of both the Kingdom of Britain and the American colonies as he journeyed between the two. Whitfield preached every day for several months at a time. Like I didn't write this here in the biographical sketch, but sometimes he would preach like three and four times a day. <clears throat> Oftentimes he would have very large congregations of thousands of people that would hear him preach. You know, like sometimes even Benjamin Franklin like would hear him preach and like in the Philadelphia area. <clears throat> and in the fields, would hear him preach in the fields, and many of them got saved, which sparked the First Great Awakening. While preaching in the Northeast, Whitfield became good friends also with Jonathan Edwards. One time, Whitfield journeyed on horseback from New York City to Charleston, South Carolina, on a preaching tour. Now, at that time, it was the longest journey by a Caucasian person in the American colonies. That had been done before by Native Americans, but 
Whitfield was the first of European descent. Whitfield also made a point to preach to African Americans and was staunchly opposed to the cruel treatment of slaves. On November 14, 1741, Whitfield married Elizabeth Gwynn. Perhaps Whitfield's love for preaching could be seen in the fact that he went open air preaching twice a day, even on his honeymoon. And George Whitfield's legacy is, uh, is seen today in many ways. Whitfield County in Georgia is named after the preacher. Three churches in England, one in Bristol and two in London, are named after the evangelist, all named Whitfield Ta Whitfield's Tabernacle. And uh, many people consider Whitfield to be the father of modern evangelists and perhaps the greatest evangelist to ever live certainly was one of the best. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 8. But what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Amen. That word, that's what preachers ought to have, that word in their heart that they just love. Colossians 1.25 Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Certainly that's what we need more than anything, amen. Preachers. More preachers in this time. Particularly more revivalists. Certainly need more revivalists in order to have another great awakening. Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all. Long suffering and doctrine. Amen. So certainly, preach the word. Amen. As a man of God. Preach the good Lord's word. And be faithful. Amen. And pray and ask that God would make you a revivalist, amen, in such need of revival. And with that need of revival, we certainly need these revivalists, these people that love God with a whole heart and just want to give their life to Him. So what a great challenge there, you know, just to sell out to God, to give Him all of our time, and, you know, be for Him at any and all cost. And thank you so much for being with us uh, here today. Next week with our biographical sketch, we'll be looking at Jonathan Edwards, and I believe that'll be the last one from that time frame of the 1700s. Uh, we'll move on to the 1800s after that, but uh, next week we'll be looking at Jonathan Edwards, and so you come on back and be with us and be praying for us as we're praying for everybody out there, and speaking of which, we'll close in prayer. Our Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for the gifts of sin. We're so thankful, Lord God, for our salvation and all that you've done for us. Uh, so thankful, Lord God, to open up your word and to expound it and to look at these great men that you used. And just pray, Lord, that you bless your word, that you multiply it, that we would be that revivalist, have that heart for revival, that we would ever be faithful and walk with you and be what we ought to be and do what we ought to be for you, Lord. Just help us and continue to lead God and direct us and use us for your honor and glory. And uh, we just pray that you give our dear listeners a special blessing. Just take care of us. Give us that which we need, Lord, to do your work and will. And we'll certainly be careful, Lord, to give you all, and all the praise and all the glory for it all because whether you long for it's in the blessing. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. Amen and amen. And thank you so much, folks, for being with us. And we'll see you next time. Until the daybreak and the shadows flee away, I'm Dr. Cooper, and I love you, and I appreciate you.